so this is our agenda for today, and these are the steps. This is what, this is what that process looks like. At first, we're going to show you how to download anticipated weather from NOAA. Then we're going to show you how to enter planned weather into your schedule. We're going to show you how to download observed weather. We're also going to uh, provide a little bit more context for what these terms mean. Um, we're going to show you how to enter actual weather into your schedule, and then we're going to show you a preview of this new weather mode. We've been talking about some of these weather terms, and just to get everybody on the same page, we're using the term anticipated weather, and we use this term to represent normal adverse weather. Now, what does normal and adverse weather mean? You know, when we look to AECE, the recommended practice, normal weather basically just represents expected weather that's going to happen uh, based on historical weather conditions at your project site. Adverse weather represents weather that is going to affect, negatively affect your productivity. And a key takeaway about adverse weather is that this is also totally un unique to your project site. So um, it can't really be standardized. So this is the simple Venn diagram that shows you that anticipated weather in our parlance just means the intersection of normal adverse weather. So with that, we're going to start with the demo now and we're going to show you how to proceed with this first step of downloading anticipated weather. You can see we have a tab at the top for weather. So we can go ahead and click that. And we can go to anticipated. And at the top, click configure. So here at the top, we see a section for NOAA access. So this is, of course, what gives you access to their information. We bundle a token or a key or a license, if you will, so you don't have to go register and do all that stuff. So for our purposes and for your use, you can just leave it on the default token, which is what's bundled for your access. Below that, we have some units if you want to look at metric or standard. And below that, the latitude and longitude. Now, the one thing I want to point out here, and this project was in southeast Michigan, so we can go look for the latitude and longitude. And I know you're thinking, well, what the hell is the latitude and longitude of my site? It's very easy if you just go to Google. Just put in lat long, and you can put a city or a location or a site, and Google will tell you. Um, as you just saw, he pulled it up for Detroit. So we can just type it in. Now, it's important to note that <clears throat> the latitude and longitude is usually provided in degrees west. So if you're in the western hemisphere, you'll just want to put a negative sign in front to convert from east to west. Just something to keep in mind. Now, below that, we have a section for the different types of weather. We have precipitation and the, the specific threshold that you'd like to enter. We also see below that recovery precipitation. So what this means is if it rains over one inch, the following day is taken off due to weather. You see some options for wind and low temperature. And one thing I want to mention here is days are considered whole day losses. So you know, at PMA, we have a best practice where we consider perhaps if it rains over a tenth of an inch in the afternoon, only the afternoon is taken off due to weather, not the whole day. Similar with temperature, where you would actually look at productivity losses by hour. But for this first iteration, it's in whole day losses. And this is something that will improve as we, as we develop the software. Now in this case, we can go ahead and uh, I'd like to activate low temperature here and set a threshold. You know, 10 Fahrenheit was popular, uh, was based on research, was a good setting. I'd like to just choose zero Fahrenheit just because we'd like to show you once we look at the data. And once we've configured it, we can go ahead and click OK. Now this is where you need an active internet connection uh, because we are connecting to NOAA to get this data. Now once we've filled it in, we see the stations that are available to us here within 10 mile radius. We have Detroit City, uh, and it also shows us the distance from our latitude and longitude, 5.7 miles in this case. And if you want, you can, at this stage, choose even more than one station. So maybe your particular site is in between two stations, or you see the data from one, you're not happy with it. You can choose two, three, four, and it's going to average those together to give you the data. Let's just choose Detroit and go ahead and click Load. Now we've just preloaded the weather data here so we can keep the demo moving. But live, it takes about two to three minutes to pull in 10 years of data. And it's all weather types. So even though we only said precipitation and temperature, it's bringing in everything so that you can use it later if you change your mind. All right, and here we see the data. And so these are 10-year averages broken down by month, okay? And what we see here is we see precipitation over 10 years, average of four days uh, in January. 
one day below zero Fahrenheit for uh, temperature. Now, I wanted to point out that uh, when we're looking at uh, losses, we follow a very specific sequence. First, we look at did it rain over our input threshold? So for example, January 1st, it rained over a tenth of an inch. We mark that as a weather day. Now we, now we, go, we go on and we look, did, it, uh, did wind occur over our threshold? Even if it did, we can't mark that day as a weather day again. We can't double count. So we're only counting uh, the same day once. And, and the, the sequence is what you see over here on the PowerPoint. So I say this because if you look at precipitation, you might see three. And if you look at low temp, you might see uh, uh, one. And when you look up at the station, it might not be four. Because at the station level, it's combining all your selected weather types. On the individual rows, it's just telling you isolated, just for that weather type, how many days were averaged over 10 years. Does that make sense? Furthermore, since at this point, we're only looking at whole day losses, we do, at, we do round up in the interface here. So I actually have this written down so I can point it out here. Um, here, for precipitation in February, we see a three, which was actually a 3.2. Uh, uh, 3 so it's rounded down to three whole day losses. For temperature, we see a one, which was actually 1.3. So we round down to one. But when you look at them together, you end up with a 4.5, which is rounded up to five. So that's why also in this case, it's not adding up. So in this case, precipitation and low temperature didn't occur on the same day, but it's not adding up due to rounding. So this is just something to keep in mind when you're looking at the data, you might see, well, why doesn't it add up? And it could be for one of these two reasons. Like I said, once we evolve the product more and we start looking at partial day losses, then this rounding issue would go away. That's it, you got 10 years of anticipated weather. And Sergio, what he's showing us is that you can expand the window, you can make it larger. Uh, you can also send this out to Excel, so you can use the data, you can save it. And let's keep that up uh, because we're gonna come back to that and use that later. So now what we'd like to do is get this data into our schedule. And that's where planned, this term planned weather comes in. Planned weather is what we call the anticipated weather in your schedule right of the day to day. So the way we're gonna do this, again, our goal is to show you how you can weatherproof your schedule today using the best available methods. Uh, the weather mode and profiles are going to be forthcoming, but we want you in 5.2 to be able to do this already. And how do we do that? We're going to use weather calendars, and we can do that in the tools menu in NetPoint. And we can go ahead and create a new calendar. This is going to be a calendar where we're going to put in the data for precipitation and temperature below uh, zero Fahrenheit. We can choose a template. And this is just going to populate what are the holidays and work week for our new calendar. And you see, we, ha we actually have a feature down at the bottom for weather days. This is uh, not a new feature in, in NetPoint, but it's very nice because if you're doing this in P6, how do you randomly distribute those days throughout the month? Uh, NetPoint does this for you just by, if you just put the total in, and it, it, it'll assign those days throughout the month for, month for you. So once we have our calendar, we've go, gone ahead for the demo and we've pre-identified the activities that are going to be affected in this schedule by uh, precipitation over a tenth of an inch and temperatures below zero Fahrenheit. We have a code for it. I think uh, a gentleman was referring to how we could code our schedules uh, due, due to different types of weather. And we've actually done that here. So you also see some are affected by wind, uh, some earthwork activities, et cetera. So what we want to do for this example is select all the, those activities. You can see they have a check in the assigned column at the left. So we're just gonna use the button at the bottom. It's gonna automatically select all the activities that are assigned the precipitation low temperature code. And we're gonna, we're gonna globally apply this new calendar to them. We can do that in the weather tab. And now we go to planned. We're gonna choose the method that we mentioned, weather calendars, and we see our calendar here. And if we open it up, we see it's already checked the box here for us. But we have weather in 2016, and it's also broken down by, uh, by month. And it shows us our totals over here, and these are the same numbers that Sergio just, just put in. This is uh, something that's different. If you're doing this in P6, 
all you would do is you would come in here and you would manually check the box next to all your weather days. So we have <clears throat> in this schedule now our planned weather and we have our anticipated weather. And what I want to point out now is what we call the planned weather index. This is a new metric that we've coined and it is simply the planned weather divided by the anticipated weather. And this is huge. This gives you a way to understand how reliable is the weather that you have in your schedule. This is a pretty advanced topic, right? Probably heretofore you're just worried, is, worried about is weather in there, not how good is it. But this gives you a way to do that. All right, so we have our planned weather, our anticipated weather. So now we want to fast forward in time and imagine it's time to do an update to our schedule. So now we want to bring in what we call observed weather. And this is the adverse weather left of the day to date according to the NOAA weather stations. All right, so now, like I was saying, your planned weather index is one because it's, we can see the total, why don't you, uh, you search for weather. Yeah. Our anticipated weather count is 183 days total for this project. And the planned weather is 183, so 183 divided by 183, 183 is one. And actually, I, I, you know, I didn't look at this earlier. Can you go to the inputs and show us how many anticipated weather days per year did we have for this schedule? So it's still in the Excel file. Oh, there we go. 69 anticipated weather days per year for temperatures below zero and rain over a tenth of an inch. It's a lot. All right, so observed weather. So what we'd like to do to get this data from NOAA is come to our schedule and drop a new data date. So let's imagine a month has gone by. We'll drop a data date at the end of April. We can take a target, like Renee said. We can go back to the inputs up at the top. We can now say we're doing an update. It's no longer an unprogressed baseline. Click over to weather and to observed. Now in this case, if you may be, we're averaging together more than one station on the anticipated side, here you have to choose one station. So we're, look, we're interested in what was the observed weather for one station at this point. And here we can see we have a total of six, or here in April, we have a total of five observed days, and we can see when they occurred. April 10th, 21st, 25th, 26th, and 30th, an entire, we, we, we show a one there, meaning the entire day has been marked off because precipitation occurred over a tenth of an inch. We also show you what was the anticipated for April that we pulled in from NOAA. In this case, we actually anticipated seven days, so we actually have minus two abnormal, which is interesting. I think you'd probably want it to be the other way around, but, but this is possible, right? This is possible that the weather that actually occurred is better than the average, and this is showing you that. So like I said, you can only use one station, and if one of these same days the temperature was below zero Fahrenheit, we're still going to show you a one there, but it's going to be grayed out. And that's just showing you again that we're not counting the same day twice for different types of weather. And the last step in weatherproofing our schedule now is putting actual weather into the schedule. And you're probably thinking, <laughs> why am I going to waste my time doing that, right? Um, but this is important, and we'll show you why. So actual weather, again, is the term we use for work stoppages due to weather left of the day to date. And for now, in 5.2, again, we're going to use calendars to do this. So let's go up to our tools menu, open up our calendar window, and now we're going to create an actual weather calendar for our same thresholds and the same work week. We can even choose our five-day precipitate temp as a template. And now what we want to do is add a new non-working day where an imaginary loss occurred due to weather. We can choose April 15th. 10th. 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 As an observed day. And add this non-working day into our new actual weather calendar. Now what we want to know is what activities left of the day to date were affected or could have been affected by rain over a tenth of an inch or temperatures below zero Fahrenheit. We can find that easily if we go back to the codes manager open up our weather code, look at precipitate temp, and we can sort by start date. We can see there's one activity with a check there, 
that's starting left of the data date. And we've uh, even gone ahead and formatted it for you so you can see it. So what we want to do is change our calendar assignment for this activity to our new actual weather calendar. Why is this important? If we just, let's imagine, okay, so we, well, I'll take an even simpler example. An activity starting on January 1st. It's got no non-working days. It's a 10-day duration, so it's finishing on January 10th. Now let's imagine two observed weather days occurred and work stopped for two days during the progress of this activity. Now, if you just come in and while you're updating your schedule and you put your actual finish date on January 12th, now your duration is going to show 12 days if you didn't update the calendar. So what's going to happen is your actual duration, as I'm calling it, is not actually going to line up with your actual start and finish dates. So from a forensic point of view, your durations are going to be inaccurate if you're going back and looking at the schedule if you didn't put in the actual days in your actual calendars. This is why we feel it's important to do this. We can open up our actual weather calendar and we will put a check in the box and click Save. Right? Because you may have all sorts of non-working days in this calendar. You just added it in a net point, but we don't know what was the source of that non-working day. This is why we want to just check the box. Now what we can do is compare the actual weather in the schedule to the observed weather from NOAA. So we see here we had six observed days. We had one actual day, and if we divide actual by observed, we get 0.17. So this is an interesting metric. And in this case, we're more flexible with our range from 0.8 to 1.2, recommended range. And you could imagine for all sorts of reasons, maybe you decided to work through adverse weather. Maybe the weather station that you're looking at the, uh, at the observed data is a little too far away from your site. But this is an interesting metric because it's another way to look at now on the updating side, how is, how is the weather in your schedule comparing to, to NOAA? So is there abnormal weather? Uh, is it negative, positive? And which brings us to our last topic today, where we want to show you weather mode and what's coming up as Guy introduced this morning. So again, we saw a similar slide like this in the keynote, and it basically shows you that the four weather planning methods that people employ today each kind of have a, a fatal flaw. Um, now, we went ahead with the calendar method, as Sevi said, because that was sort of the least bad. But the innovations are in this new weather profile feature and weather mode feature. So how, how these features work, to provide a little bit more detail again, are that um, the, weather, the weather profiles basically automatically save when we went ahead in the first step of that process and found the anticipated weather, we then had to, as, as somebody noticed, take it from Excel, put it into a calendar. But now the weather profile is automatically just going to save the anticipated data for you. And then when you go into the new weather mode, it's going to use those profiles and automatically apply it for you. So it just greatly reduces the amount of effort and labor that's required by the analyst to do this. So to do this in NetPoint, Again, as Renee mentioned, the first thing we're going to want to do is to capture a target of our baseline schedule before we've done any of this weather ana analysis work. So let's go ahead and do that. And we can, we can imagine that we already have a profile saved, uh, and it has the same amount of weather days that were generated by the analysis we just did into a profile called uh, Precip Low Temp. So, we're going to go ahead and find the same activities that were assigned to that code via the codes manager. And we're going to globally select them, just like we did in the last example. But instead of going and changing their calendar, we're going to go ahead and just assign them this new weather profile. So you can see we have, have the weather profile here. So the process is similar, but there are some important distinctions. But once we've assigned this new profile, now we have a new option up in the toolbar here. We have a new option for weather mode right there. So we can go ahead and enter weather mode. And now what that's going to do is just immediately apply those anticipated weather days from the weather profile to, to this version of the schedule. 
And if you look closely, you can see a value next to the duration for this activity here. And that's basically telling you plainly, these are, this is the extra amount of time that's been added to each of these activities due to the weather being factored into your schedule. So from here, now that we have a target saved for the baseline schedule, we've, uh, we have the profile with the anticipated weather. We've assigned it, we've gone into weather mode. Now we can go into the visual target mode. Uh, we can choose the base case target we had captured as the schedule to compare against, and we can, can, we can choose the current state of the schedule, which is weather to, for the other part of the comparison. And here we can enter some criteria. What this is basically doing is saying any, any activity with a finished date one day later, we want it to be larger and darker so we can clearly identify it on the canvas. Now, once we go ahead and do that and fade everything else out, now, I mean, we, we had also already uh, applied a pattern to this, so now it's just super easy to see which activities have been affected by the, by the weather on the canvas, and it's just a nice way to be able to do this visually. And so, just to conclude again, you know, the power of this is being able to, to just do it a lot more seamlessly than via the current weather calendar method, and using other innovations in NetPoint, like the visual target mode, to just to be able to you know, really have a more visual way to, to communicate this information to, to other people who may not have been as involved in the analysis. And just to show you the, you know, the effect on the final completion down here going in and out of weather mode, without weather, we're finishing on 1024. We go into weather mode and we're finishing on 41. And you can toggle back and forth, turning on and off weather like that. That's it. Thank you.